no matter what your perspective is, if there's one issue that unites everyone, it is that the bloodshed that Palestinians have withstood is completely and utterly Im unimaginable. Anyway, let's watch Bassem Youssef yeah. versus Piers Morgan now. I was done about you. Maybe you weren't surprised. I was completely staggered by the response globally to our interview several weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Were you taken aback by the Bro, he's such a Klaus shark. He uh, yes, he changed he, he switched sides, bro. I, I swear to God. The only um, side that matters right now for you years, though the media, is the top of the hour ad break avoidance side. Has, uh, been um, showing a certain point of view. I'm not Third streamer doesn't know about DNS 222. Bitch, I've been in America for that reason. It allow certain voices, certain um, voices from the other side to be heard. And that is why you see the frustration. You all, whenever you speak to people in the Middle East, they tell you the same thing. Uh, they, 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 they not very happy with the, the coverage of the Middle because our voices are not heard. Now, I am the least qualified person ever to talk about this conflict. And yet, just because I relate some of the talking points that we say and we hear the whole time, mm. people felt heard. And when you, when, when people have this feeling, they, they, they're happy. They, are, they, 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 they have this response. They said, like, oh my God. For the, for the first time, the West are actually hearing our point He's of so view. right. Some of the points He's of view so might fucking not right. be, go well with other people, but at least we have a conversation. And I think that is the reason why people reacted that way. Uh, yeah. It's, it's such an incendiary subject matter. I've never seen social media so ablaze with hostility on, on both sides. Did you actually, as well as enormous praise from the Arab world, did you also get criticized by some parts of the Arab world for not going perhaps Tired. hard enough? Oh, you didn't do that, you didn't do that. Uh -huh. The thing is, this is like, uh, you're damn if you do, you're damn if you're not. Right. If you don't speak up, why don't you speak up? If you speak up, you didn't speak up. Whenever. If you're I done, hope, why are you doing If you speak up too much, oh. I hope Pierce doesn't just like fucking use uh, Bussem's like media interest, like, because he's a media guy, to just like drive the conversation away to she dumb shit. On social media. But yeah, there was a backlash, but there's also a backlash from the other side, which um, I, I mean, here mm. and other comedy clubs, I worked with people from all kinds of different backgrounds. Mm. Uh, Jewish, Christians, Muslims, Arabs, atheists, all kinds of people. And there are a lot of people who went to my socials like, oh, so you're a terrorist sympathizer now, you know? And uh, I think it is important to have uh, a nuanced, deep, interesting, intelligent conversation. A lot of people waiting for this mm. are kind of like, yeah, Basim, bury Pierce, mm. show him. And this is the problem with the news today. The problem is the news today, it's not about the news anymore. Mm. It's about the people giving you the news. Mm. So it becomes a show, a circus. Two gladiators in the Colosseum. <laughs> Two pigs fighting in the mud. And this is why people don't get anything out of it. It's a circus. You know, one of the things I heard a lot was, who is this guy? And they weren't talking about me. Sometimes, <laughs> I, sometimes I won't. <laughs> now, obviously, you're very, very well known in the Arab world. Now, you're known as the kind of, they call you the Arab John Stewart, and you're well known in America, but you weren't that well known, for example, in the UK. Mm. Uh, and I think what this interview did, it, it made a lot of people think, wow, all right, this, this is incredible, mm. but tell me more about Bassam Yusuf. And I, I did a bit of research into your life, and it is a fascinating journey that you've gone on to get here mm. to Los Angeles. And I think it's worth just taking a little beat here to talk about this because you began in Cairo as a heart surgeon. I mean, yeah. that was your career path. Yes. And, yes. You, and you were a heart surgeon. I was a heart surgeon until, yeah. Uh, I, I spent 19 years in that career, seven years in medical school, 12 years as a practicing doctor. And uh, 2011 happened and the revolution happened and I had my own show on YouTube. I did like a small vi videos. Well, I'm going to come to this because yeah. I was in, I, by coincidence, I had just joined CNN to replace the great Larry yes. King. And I hadn't actually done any live show. I'd done a few weeks since I joined of taped interviews with big names, Donald Trump, Oprah Winfrey, things like that. And I was flying back to Los Angeles when I got a message that Egypt was going up in the start of the Arab Spring. And I went live for the first time and it was about the Arab Spring. And it was about what was happening in Egypt. And at the same time, you in Egypt, were actually in Tahrir Square helping wounded protesters, actually medically treating them. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, this was a kind of movement that inspired a lot of Egyptians. Um, at the time, I was, you know, I was in the hospital, and a, a lot of people just had volunteered, uh -huh. and the, the nurses were just like giving us like supplies, go, 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 and we were going there, and we were basically tending to the wounded because it is, and and it kind of gives you a different perspective when you see helpless, <coughs> defenseless people who do who are not armed. Mm -hmm. They are being beaten by security forces, military forces, being shot, being, uh, you know, hurt. And uh, all we can do is just like provide some medical attention. And it kind of gives you a perspective to see how humanity sometimes can show its most ugly face. And the suppression of free speech, freedom yeah. of expression, yeah. the ability of people to say what they honestly feel about a situation, yes. and the suppression of people's basic rights to freedom. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, that kind of like uh, taught me a lot and, uh, and inspired me to do the show. But you know... Well, you start, I mean, it's a crazy story, this, and I, I want to tell it because you just decided to do <laughs> five minute stuff on YouTube, yeah. and you were expecting a few people to watch yeah. it. And then, literally, it just flies, and suddenly right. you're getting millions of people watching this. And very quickly, one of the big networks comes in, mm. and then you're suddenly doing this stuff for 30 to 40 million people. Yeah. Like a third of the entire population of Egypt yeah. is tuning in to watch it. You're the biggest star of Egyptian television. Oh, please. You were. Don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody, I mean, what an extraordinary thing, though, for a heart surgeon yeah. to go from helping protesters medically in Tahrir Square, the start yeah. of the Arab Spring, to within a year, you're the biggest star on Egyptian television. It's, it's a crazy it thing. Do, it, it doesn't sound as glamorous. As Stop, dude. Why? Dude, this is so dumb. Anyone who knows they have a fucking moment of opportunity in fucking Western media in front of such a large audience knows that the goal is to fucking talk about Palestinians, talk about Palestinians, talk about Palestinians. Stop glazing yourself up, man. Holy shit. I think he's very good. I think he's he's very good at, at talking about the situation on the ground. But it's like, I don't, I don't, you just explain how the media people become the highlight of the news and transition into glazing each other. Yeah, I know. I hate this. Well, many, many reasons. This is why I did not want to fucking have a conversation with Piers Morgan about like propaganda or who's a propagandist or whatever. Not because, like, oh, it's an indefensible position. No, I, I love debating. I, no matter how much I fucking abhor debate pervertry, I debate for fucking hours, okay? I'm stubborn as shit. I'm a stubborn motherfucker. It's just that right now, this is an idiotic fucking time to talk about it. It's selfish. It was a warrant for my arrest, and then I turned myself in, and I was interrogated... And it was the funniest interrogation ever. And in my stand-up shows, I, I, I talk about that scene. Because the guards were reading the stuff out and laughing, right? Well, the guards were taking selfies with me, which is funny. Right. <laughs> and and, the, uh, and, the, and it, the exchange between me and the inter and persecutor, a general persecutor, was extremely funny. I mean, I don't like to victimize myself. I don't like, oh, look at that. I actually like to find humor. But why were the, you arrested? What was the criteria? Oh, yeah. The, I, I think the list was insulting Islam insulting the president, spreading false rumors and disrupting the fabric of society. And, uh, and uh, it was, I think the people in the room didn't know what to do with me mm. because they ended up discussing my jokes. So it turned into a writer's room. And I, I was kind of like, how do you think we make this funnier? And it was the funniest exchange ever. And after six hours, I, I was let go. Mm. And uh, Was it scary though at the same time that suddenly the machinery was getting a grip of you because it was to get a lot scarier. But was it in that moment when you first got arrested, you thought, I'm being arrested for breaching my freedom of speech, right? It, for some reason. Oh, my God. I, I, I just, like, went with the flow. I went to the interrogation wearing the big hat. I went to the show. It's, it was... I don't want to talk about like internal Egyptian politics, okay? And and I have stopped short of discussing like Bassem Youssef's own personal perspective on Egyptian politics in general. I hate that like there's a Israel at war ticker on the bottom of the fucking show and they're just like talking about this shit. I saw the interview is two hours, you gotta chill. I know, but this is the most important part of the interview. This is the part that people watch and the part that people watch is just like his background interesting story because the first episode that was aired 
after the removal of the Muslim Brotherhood, everybody was waiting to see what I would say. Because by that time... Well, now he's talking about it. Okay, were, never mind. Like me and me and Islamic channels, like it's like they had five channels and they were like me and mm -hmm. them going like that. They, they had like five channels that have only one hour a week. And then they were removed. And then a lot of the other dissident voices were also being shut down. Now, our, people are waiting. What will Basim say? Mm. Yeah, and what will he say? on the day that the show aired... I know what he said. The next day I went... I went out and everybody's like, good, good, at least somebody is speaking. It was a very controversial episode. Nobody liked it. And yet everybody liked it. Because people said, like, you're supporting the coup. No, you're the Muslim Brotherhood. Everybody accused me of something. All I did in that episode was just being a mirror of what is happening in the street and showing them how ridiculous it is. You didn't take your fixed position. Well, my position, depending on where, where what's your position? What did you intend your position? My, my position was to show the ridiculousness of <clears throat> how the pe people now was like, oh, we got rid of Islamic fascism, but we are heading towards another fascism. Mm. Uh, there was, and there was a song that I did that was very controversial. People, and it's very funny, the, the pro-Muslim Brotherhood thought that this is a disrespect to the people who died. And on the other side, the people said that this is a disrespect mm -hmm. to the army. And when you manage to offend everybody, you know you're right. Yes. Oh and then the God. people in the middle is like, oh, you weren't you weren't tough enough. And yeah. I was told, it's like, why didn't you go after? The, 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 free, the ceiling of freedom just went down and I was just like, it was very difficult. It is very difficult to go against pa uh, an, uh, an authority that, is very, that was very popular at the time. And especially a military authority with oh, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of experience <sighs> oh, yeah. of weaponizing these situations. Yeah. You had death threats. People would always choose, most of the time, they would always choose the military form rather than the religious form because mm. they, they kind of like, uh, at least they are not infringing on my personal freedom, not yet. But, uh, but you had threats on your life, didn't you? Oh, all the time. I don't talk about that because like, I have been having death threats like never stopped since 2011, never stopped. Have they continued since our last interview? Oh yeah, they never stopped. People threatening to kill you? All the time. Wh why, for what reason? Oh, uh, for just saying something that they don't like. Oh, because you, you are against uh, Egypt, you're against Islam, you're against our- The problem is, the guy that was fucking overthrown was a popularly elected Muslim Brotherhood guy. And the issue is that he was overthrown with a violent military coup, okay? And the violent military coup that took place- that also killed a shit ton of fucking protesters, as a matter of fact, was conducted by U.S. aligned, uh, U.S. aligned forces that were supposedly fucking liberal. Oh, what the fuck? What's going on? Is there an ad break? What? They just hit us with a commercial break. The problem always, the problem always is that, and CC, who they now have, was a high ranking official in the security forces. Yeah. The, the problem is always your vote for Islamic Brotherhood. No way. No. The issue always when it comes to affairs in other countries is that it is more complex than the way you understand it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like anything and everything that people do, anything and everything that people do, uh, if it does not serve America's interests, will always be used against them. So the people always are stuck between a rock and a hard place, okay? Mostly was only popular amongst Muslim Brotherhood members and people wanted him out but didn't want another military piece of shit, but the revolution got hijacked. This has happened time and time again in, I mean, this has happened in Turkey as well. This happens everywhere. It also, it, I mean, it's a, it's a constant. It's a constant in places like Turkey as well. It's a constant in places like Iran as well. You have, uh, you have Western influence that creates a lot of anger and, the, and resentment in the population, a lot of death and destruction at the behest of Western-backed leadership that causes people to find emancipation in the most reactionary forces, in the most reactionary groups, in the most reactionary ideologies, okay? Like, Iran is right there. It is a perfect representation of this. It is seen as a, an anti-Western force, and of course, they are brutal. Of course, they are uh, uh, theocratic. Of course, they're awful. Not a single person, not a single leftist, for example, uh, living in Iran will tell you otherwise. Like, nobody wants to live under a, a uh, theocratic dictatorship, okay? Nobody. It's not great. But 
You can't have a democratic process if you're constantly fucking waging war against the most important, most powerful military machine on the planet. With your lawyer said, you've got to get out of it. You've got to get out of Egypt. It's yeah. getting too dangerous. Yeah. Something bad's going to happen. You're going to yeah. get arrested again and probably sung in jail or you're going to he's going to try and kill you and you flee to dubai mm -hmm. and then you end up here yes. in america yes was that always the plan to eventually come to america or was it expediency because of what happened well it's funny that you said that because i visited the united states after the first year of my show mm. and uh, um, a doctor that's there an egyptian doctor has been there for for a while i said listen Bessem, you you are very visible in the media and i think you can use that to apply for a green card as a special talent and i did and it's like i, I I have like a huge show in It's Egypt. actually the criteria, because I have the same, yeah. is uh, a, an alien of exceptional ability. Yes. Is what they call you. Yes, we're very, Charmingly. Yes, we're very exceptionally exceptional. able aliens. We are, but we're still aliens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know, it always makes me laugh. <laughs> yeah. like, you can come here, but you are well, an alien. You're an alien, but you're exceptional. Yeah. And uh, I, um, I just I, I applied for it and I got it. Uh, I got the Time 100 that helped both from my... Uh, my application, and said, ah, maybe I'm not going to use it. And then when that happens, ooh, that green card came handy. Mm. So a lot of people think that I'm here on asylum. I'm not. I just, it was just a, a, a strike of luck. You now do stand up, mm -hmm. and you've done it for five years, and fascinatingly, you do some of it for an Arab audience. You have a whole in show Arabic. in Arabic, and, a, and an English speaking yes. version. Yes. And they're probably very different, right? Totally because different. Different sensibilities, different humor, yeah. different crowds, yes. different expectations. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, when the uh, Arab audience come to my show, they expect that it's going to be another version of my show that I did in Egypt. And I said, no, it's a my personal story. Even then, this weekend, right before I met you, because of our interview, I sold out Arizona. Really? <laughs> yes. And I, and, I, and I stood, and the first... Oh, my God. I, I don't like this. This gives me more respect for commentators like you didn't flinch from the topics in weeks. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that this is like... Do you want to know how little... Uh, anyone cares about Egypt? Check this. The Rabah massacre. Yeah. On August 14th, 2013, the Egyptian police and to a lesser extent, the armed forces under the command of then Defense Minister Abdel Fattah el-Sisi dispersed two camps of protesters in Cairo, one at the Al-Nahda Square and a larger one at the Rabah al Adawiya Square, the two sites that had been occupied by supporters of President Mohamed Morsi, who had been removed from office by a military little over a month earlier following mass protests against his rule. Initiatives to end the six-week sit-ins by peaceful means had failed, and the camps were cleared out within hours. Human Rights Watch described the sit-in dispersals as crimes against humanity and called them one of the world's largest killings of demonstrators in a single day in recent history in reference to the numerous deaths that occurred. The exact death toll during the incident is unclear and multiple sources have given conflicting estimates. Human Rights Watch states that at least 904 protesters were killed, 817 in Rabah Square and 87 in al Nahda Square, while strongly suggesting that at least 1,000 protesters died during the dispersal. The Egyptian Health Ministry announced that 593 protesters and 43 police officers were killed, and at least 3,994 3 individuals were injured. Uh, I will not be showing you the actual photos oh they do have some of the casualty photos okay the background is following the 2011 egyptian revolution which ousted hosni mubarak and subsequent instability mass protests calling for the resignation of president Mohamed morsi culminated in the 2013 egyptian coup d'etat prior to the anti-morsi uprising supporters of the deposed president occupied two squares rabah al adawiya in nasser city in cairo and al nahda in giza originally to celebrate the one-year anniversary of his presidency, but from three from the 3rd of July onwards to protest his ouster, vowing to remain there until Morsi was reinstated. Authorities delayed clearing the two protest camps as internal and external recon reconciliation, uh, reconciliation processes were established to attempt to resolve this crisis peacefully. According to the military, the sit-ins were flashpoints for outbreaks of violence and bloody confrontations among pro-Morsi and anti-Morsi demonstrators and security forces. Oh, they're on Palestine now? Okay, let's talk. About, all right, let's get back to this. We'll neighbors. talk. We'll cover Egyptian politics so, and how important it is to Palestinian now, this politics ready again. For you, okay? This time I'm ready for the humor. <laughs> oh, you're ready. Okay. No, but it's interesting because last time I was very taken aback. <laughs> and I remember thinking as you were doing this at the, right off the top, I remember feeling very uncomfortable, unusually uncomfortable, and thinking I didn't know how to react to that. I didn't know whether I was supposed to laugh 
or be silent or and I sort of ended up sort of slightly grimacing. Doesn't mean his takes on Palestine are wrong. They're not. And I realized it was very powerful what you were doing. It was satirical, but it was savagely satirical and extremely effective. And that's why I think the interview did so well. You know why? Because all I did was just take the talking points that's been in the media, mm. not just for mm. after October 7th, all through the conflict. It's always like, we need to kill it. All right. You need to kill five? No, kill ten. You need to kill some? No, kill all. This is what satire does. You take, uh, take reality, flip it on its head, exaggerate it, and then you can see how sometimes very uncomfortable and even sometimes stupid that sounds. Mm. I, I, I was just reacting to whatever the media is telling me. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, okay let's do it. Go, mm. um, there's no pushback. So suddenly, the person who was proposing the most extreme measures is like, oh, we'll take it. Oh, no, 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 that's too much. So that, that was like a very simple technique. I just talk, took the talking point and just exaggerated it. Was, it was devastatingly effective, I yeah. Um First, before we go any further, how is your wife's family? Because she is half Palestinian. Yeah. Are they okay? Are no, they... They're, they're good. They're good. They are safe for now. Yeah. Um, and as like the last week, there was no internet, as you have. Yes. You know, I, I saw you tweet at the IDF. It's like, how can they know? And you if know they, how many uh, views that tweet? It's at nearly 40 million. Yeah. Me just saying, how are they going to see this message if you've cut the yeah. internet off? Yeah. I'm, I'm Activists who led the revolution the in 2011 like, protested the again after Morsi like insisted he had people. powers of the constitution didn't give him. The rule of law wasn't honored, and this conflict led to the military taking advantage of the situation. There's a lot of context that the Wikipedia article can't give. That tweet I did was enormous, as everything is in this in this thing. And I had a lot of people say, "Finally, Piers, you get it, right? Finally, you get it." And I wanted to say, "Listen." I'm, I'm trying to reach a place where I get this, but mm -hmm. it's an incredibly complicated issue mm -hmm. for someone who is not Arabic or Jewish to poke their head into. And I've had to cover it as a journalist for a long, long time. I think I said to you before that I was editor of a Daily Mirror in England when we opposed the Iraq war, for example. So, you know, I have taken stands on this thing. On this one, I find, and I'm going to be completely straight with you, I discussed this with Jordan Peterson. Um, like I don't think the Israeli apartheid uh, regime is complicated, but if you're going to talk about in which if you're going to talk about Egypt, it is Yahoo certainly more enough. complicated. And he was actually very self-reflective about that in the interview we did this week, where he later issued a 20-minute video because he said sometimes a, a one-line tweet can be unnecessarily inflammatory to people. Much better to take time to explain it. Here's here's where I've got to with this conflict now. I viewed what happened on October the 7th as a, an absolutely appalling atrocity, a terror attack of unimaginable horror. And I absolutely think that Israel has a right to defend itself from the people who committed it, Hamas. And I've questioned for the last three, four weeks, what is a proportionate response? And I have said repeatedly, I don't know the answer. I want people who have a view to have a view about that. And I'll ask you, again, about where you think we are with this. I also acknowledge that Hamas live amongst civilian population in Gaza. And therefore, if you do what the Israelis are currently doing, which is a ground offensive into Gaza, a lot of civilians are going to get killed. And at what point does that become disproportionate or even illegal? And I don't know the answers to those questions. And I have a moral quandary because my instinct is to say that Israel has no choice but to respond to what happened in a very forceful manner. I understand why they want to eliminate Hamas altogether. I understand that if they feel they can, then perhaps we can move to a, a, a two-state solution or peace or whatever it may be, although I don't think that Netanyahu will ever be the person to do that. But the, the moral question for me is, at what point does this become disproportionate? And when you see thousands of children being killed in Gaza, it fills me with utter horror. And then people say, well, do you condemn it? I find it very easy to condemn Israel turning off the water, Israel turning off the power. I think it's terrible what's happening in the West Bank with the settlers. I think that the stuff there is completely easy to condemn. But can I hand on heart condemn Israel trying to destroy Hamas after what they did on October the 7th? That is where I'm struggling to find myself saying I condemn it because I believe that they are right to try and destroy Hamas. Now, what do you feel about my moral quandary? 
Well, there is there's a lot of points. Very long, and I think it, this is this will kind of like uh, lay the ground rules for that uh, interview. There is the whole thing about like, is it right to defend itself? The condemnation. First of all, let's start with condemnation. Yes. You want my opinion? Yes. Condemning Hamas or condemning Israel? Yes. Completely useless. Mm. Completely useless. Why? You, I condemn Hamas. You condemn Israel. Interview is over. What happened? Nothing. Mm. It is just checkpoint. Like morality checkpoints. But I've interviewed a lot of pro-Palestinians, for example, some of whom will immediately say, I unreservedly condemn the terror attacks of October the 7th, mm -hmm. and then go on to criticize yeah. Israel. And I think that's a very, well, it's a position I can completely respect. Yeah. But I find it much harder to respect a pro-Palestinian guest on my show if they simply resolutely refuse to say yeah that they can condemn the terror yeah. attacks. Yes. I find that less- I like that he's just fucking turning around and using Bassem Yusuf after glazing him to fucking shit on previous uh, guests that he's One had. One thing that I have noticed, not just on the coverage of these events, the-, the Now the, they can get together uh, and be like, before, yeah. Before and before, every time this starts, people say, we don't know what's happening. It's a very complicated situation. Right. What is happening now? And for me, as a viewer, if a conflict that's been there for 75 years and the media with all this technology has been covering it and we hear the same exact words, we don't know what's happening. It's complicated. It's a very complex. That is a failure of the media apparatus. That is the failure to themselves and for the audience because why every time this happens, it seems like it is happening from, from, from point zero. And I think to help understand that, I will get to the October 7th. I will get to the condemnation. I will get to the self-defense. But I think maybe we can do, we, we have like all the time in the world yeah. and we can discuss, this, could, this interview could be a bookmark, yeah. landmark for maybe looking at that conflict yeah. in a deeper way that nobody had gone there before. Yeah. We have the views, we have people waiting, yes. you know, as I said, I'm the least qualified to discuss that, but it's an opportunity I'm not, to use listen, it. I'm not massively yeah, well qualified I, I, myself. Yeah, both of us. I'm, like, a, I'm, I mean, an, look at us. I'm two, an Irish Catholic, I right? Mean, look at us, yeah, two privileged people, one white, one, mm. one white, white wannabe, <laughs> discussing, <laughs> discussing the, the, the most complex conflict of, mm. of, our, of our history. But Yusuf literally just called it moral grandstanding checkboxing. He isn't agreeing with them. Yeah, I mean, he isn't. Uh, like, I think, I think it would be quite difficult for someone like uh, Bassem Yusuf to just like sit there and and here's the thing I, even if you're an Arab liberal I, even if you're an Egyptian liberal okay even if you no matter what your perspective is if, there, if there's one issue that unites everyone it is that the bloodshed that Palestinians have withstood is completely and utterly Im unimaginable okay like his wife directly is is Palestinian his wife's family are in Gaza that gives him a, a point of personal connection to the, the atrocities, okay? <clears throat> so no matter what happens, I don't know why there's like this fucking weird ad break that cut in uh, in the middle of this conversation, but that's what it is. It doesn't matter what his like own personal perspective is. It doesn't matter what he said in Egypt, for example. Um, ultimately, um, it doesn't matter what, what his uh, perspective was on the coup, that took place or how violent it was. Um, this is, this is no matter what happens on this issue, he's always going to have moral clarity. It's very difficult for him not to. Okay. I agree. The glaze up is annoying, but it might just be only some way viewers can humanize Arabs and Palestinians for once. I don't know. I think it just basically, uh, it improves his like liberal credentials. That's what happened in that situation. Here's viewers drop from 50 K to 25 K. Those first 10 minutes ruined it. It's so strange when Westerners talk about Arabs as if they are a singular culture, ethnicity, and language. Yes, it is by design. It is a way to, it is Islamophobia. If you think all Jews are a monolith, you are an anti-Semite. If you think all Arabs are a monolith, well, then you're just every other person in America, okay? All Arabs and all Muslims, as a matter of fact, are a monolith, okay? All members, all, all countries in the MENA region, they're all monolithic. They're all operating under the same under, under the same interest. They all fucking love one another and they all are anti-Semitic and hate Israel and and uh, that's it. What the fuck is happening here? What is uh, what are these goddamn ads? 
Can we compare the 2011 Egyptian coup to the 2016 Turkish coup attempt? Or do you think Erdogan can orchestrate such an event to gain more power? I highly think he agreed with Turkish military supremacists in Turkey after that and changed his politics the other way around. Do you think Egypt would be like Turkey now? I, I think you can compare the Egyptian coup to the 2016 uh, attempt. But, I mean, in the way that... I don't know. I, uh, we'll, I don't want to get into this right now. We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more. If you say us atheists are monolithic, I swear to God. Okay, good one. I don't know why there's still uh, this many ads happening here. I can tell you lots of Egyptians have mixed feelings about him. Lots of people are angry with him, but applaud him for using his relative fame standing up to Palestine. We'll see where this goes. Like, as you guys know, I'm no fond. I'm yeah, not a fan of Erdogan, but I've told you before. Anti-Semitism. Yes. America's involvement in Turkey in the, in the coup that happened, if it had actually succeeded, Turkey would be in a much worse position overall if Fethullah Gülen was able to, if Fethullah Gülen was able to, to seize power, an American puppet who is an Islamist Somewhere. himself and, and maybe even a worse Islamist than Erdogan, as a matter us, of fact, I, uh, I if one could even imagine such a thing. Feel that. Uh, and I think it is very important to agree on the language because the word anti-Semite has been used and abused and most most of the time not f on for the you know for the good in, um, interest of the mm. jewish people because the first two days of the coverage i watched the news and i and there was a lot of um protest that was led by jewish voice for peace mm. and they were led by people who opposed the israeli attack on the civilians and i remember quite well many of the Republican representatives in Congress I'm here came to be out called and a they were calling these what? the global intifada, the global jihad. I love it when they say jihad. They sound like a horse. Jihad. It's <laughs> very funny. Uh, or, they, or they say like these are, and I quote, Iranian-backed jihadists. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, but most of those people are Jewish. Those people who took over the capital, the same people who took over Central Station in New York, which is known as the biggest civil disobedience event in America in the last two decades, they were all Jewish. And then I find Nikki Haley saying anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism. And then I remember it's like, oh, Jewish people in America are saddled by the fact that they are not citizens of America or citizens of the world, but they are citizens of Israel and they have to back Israel in whatever they do. And these are not my words. These are the words of John Stewart. He went out and he said, and said like, and he said, it's very, very important to divide these two. And what is very, very interesting. Well, would you compare that on that specific point to the way that people try and say all Palestinians are responsible and accountable for oh, what Hamas do? Yes. Uh, yeah. In other words, I think you can be very critical of Israeli. What is happening? And their policies. Yes. Is he understanding? And Netanyahu and the politicians. What's going on? But that doesn't mean that you have to take that criticism to innocent Israelis who may have exactly the same criticism. Oh my God, and this is here's why Morgan. It's very important to have these kinds He's of evolving, he's learning. It, it, the funniest, not the funniest, the saddest thing that I saw is the people that were in so much support of Israel mm. are anti-Semite themselves. Yes. MTG, 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 uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Mm. You know, she said like, oh, those are, I send my aides and they took pictures of the protesters. Basically, she's surveilling protesters. And uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene is very known for a very famous post in 2018 where she blamed the California wildfire uh, fires on a Jewish space laser gun. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? I, I said like, oh, they were burned because Jewish investors, Rothschild and Finstein, anything was that ends with time because that's of course sounds Jewish. They put a satellite and shooting laser beams to it's, it's possible. And, and and not just her. You have uh, Steve Scola, uh, 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 Scolalis, uh, uh, Scolalis. Thank you so much. Uh, he is the, now the the speaker of the house, and he has been invited before in a in a in, for an organization that was funded by David Duke, the founder of the KKK. You have Kevin McCarthy, who is the former minority speaker, uh, uh, leader of, of the Republican Party in the House, and he accused Jewish billionaires of rigging the midterm. So how come those people are accusing us of anti-Semites? So here's the thing. So go, let's go to the equation that Nikki Haley put on Twitter. Anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism. No, it is true. People who hate Jews, they're also anti-Zionists. It is true. And you could be yeah. someone who hate Zionists, who don't like Zionists, 
and you are Semite. You can even be Jewish. Mm. And guess what? You could be a Zionist, like those people, uh, supporting Israel, and at the same time you hate the Jews because the chant, Jews will not replace us, these echoed in Charlottesville. It did not echo in Gaza. I mean, in Gaza they say war stuff in, in between the bombing under downtime. But, and these are the same people who are seen with Nick Fuentes, with with Stephen with, Bannon. And you know what's Donald most Trump interesting? Donald Trump had him for dinner yes. at Mar-a-Lago. And all of those people are buddies with Benjamin Netanyahu. Mm. So how does this work? Mm. How does this work? Mm. And you know the people who speak against this, like John Stewart, like Bernie Sanders, like uh, Naomi Klein? What do they call these people? What do they call them? Self-hating Self- Jews. Hating Jews. And you know what else they, now they call them? They call them capus. Mm. Capus. You know what's capus? Capus, basically these were the Jewish inmates in Auschwitz that were forced by the Nazis to stand as guards mm. on their own inmates. You see how degrading this is. Mm. And this is the way to shut down conversation. Mm. Anti-Semite, Islamophobe, you hate America, you hate the military, you hate Egypt, war on Christmas. This is how you shut an environment that does not allow disagreement is not an environment made for growth. It's an environment made for control. Let me ask you this. On, say the student protests in yes, America, sir. Uh, universities. I think he would do a much, he's doing a much better job than I would because, he, because he's liberal. He's actually part of the DNA of being a student, right? But I do have a problem. I think for as broad an audience as possible, liberalism, like tackling this issue from a liberal perspective is much better. Which were clearly deeply, deliberately inflammatory and hurtful Mm -hmm. to Jewish people. Secondly, I have a real problem with the students who were beaming direct pro-Hamas slogans onto buildings on campuses in America. You know, I'm all for free speech, and I really am. The whole show is predicated on that but not to the point where you see Jewish students barricaded into libraries because a mob is descending on them. There is a distinction to me between people who are obviously overtly... I mean, there was a professor at Cornell University who was literally seen in public shouting how exhilarated he felt by the attacks of October the 7th. Mm -hmm. He still hasn't been fired, that guy. Mm -hmm. I think that crosses a line. Do you? Yeah. I do not like this way. I mean, I can understand why, but I don't condone it. I would never, because you have to understand, these people, again, I'm not supporting them. Uh, I just want to make sure about two things. The reason that I started with anti-Semitism, because I wanted to make sure to clear any confusion mm. that when I speak about Israel, I'm speaking about Israel. Yes. When I speak about Jewish people, I speak about Jewish people. Yes. When I speak about my Zionists, I speak about my Zionists. It would very, because no, I, I think it was yeah, very powerful that ve- you did that. Yeah, I, I have and to be careful. That's the first thing you did, because I think it's really important. Yeah, but at the same time, when I tell you why does that happen, it doesn't mean that I condone it. There's a difference between explanation mm. and justification. Those people who are exhilarated, the way that they, this is the, the, the same uh, reason why people were so happy about the interview. Mm. What do they see? They see Israel as a, a criminal state who is killing their people, and in the same time, they are supported by the international community in America. They have no guns, they have no superpower backing them. All they have is just a feeling of happiness, like yes, our enemies that we cannot touch them has been hurt. All they can think about mm. that these are their enemies that have been hurt, right? Mm. I'm not condoning this, but again, it, 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 like when people were uh, celebrating terrorist attacks, you know, against Western, uh, mm. Western targets, of course I don't condone that. But why? Because those people have been, from, from a very young age, what have they seen? They're not being heard by the media. The, the plight and the suffering of the brothers in, Israel, in, in Palestine and the Arab world are not being here. People in Iraq, mm. you know, like when, when America and Britain invaded Iraq, mm. right? What, what do the Arabs saw? It's like two superpowers are coming in on, on just regular people. So whenever there was like a bomb or like an mm. attack on mm. American troops, people the starving would refugee tents yeah, and started digging enemies. Hamas tunnels through Emotions cement with bare are hands. very inflammatory. Mm. And it is not Good one, right. dude, you got but it. Those people had nothing else. All they say is just like shout. All they say is like to, to, to rejoice. It is not right. Again, I'm explaining why is this happening because it's like, yeah, if I cannot get you, I'm just gonna scratch your eyes. Mm. I'm gonna scratch your eyes because, because you've been beating me all the time and you have the whole international community backing you up and all I can do is scream. Mm. Is it right? No. But it is understandable. Again, it's not the right thing. But I, no, it's not like understandable. It's like, oh, I, I, no. But again, it is an explanation.
This is hard to this is hard for people to understand. They don't get it. They don't get it. They will never get it. You run ads like a capitalist? Yes, uh, I do. I am, dude. I am. I love capitalism. Yum yum yum. Yummy yummy yummy. What changed? Question I always ask people is what changed? Okay. Let's say I'm a capitalist and I advocate for the exact same things that I'm advocating for. Okay. Do you have an argument to the things that I'm advocating for? Or now do you still do you still just say, well, you're fucking bad at capitalism? Like, what are you going to say? This is why, like, hypocrisy baiting is so stupid when you try to, like, it's very effective as a rhetorical tool, but it's very stupid, okay? I can defend a position that I don't believe in as well, if you would like, and you would not be able to make this, like, oh, well, you're hypocritical argument in that situation, right? It's also not... It's also not exactly hypocritical anyway, but it doesn't matter. You know, is, ch is this chatter now anti-capitalist because you got money? Yeah, you don't got no capital. Here you are defending capitalism. You ain't got no capital, motherfucker. So why are you defending capitalism then? You know what I mean? You got no capital and you got no bitches. Here you are, bitchless and devoid of any capital whatsoever. Anyway. Yeah, motherfuckers think they, they buy, like, some Tesla stock and think, oh, shit. That's it. That's it, boys. Passive income time. Thinking that they fucking have any say whatsoever. Not the classiest point, but yeah, true, lol. That's my point. It's like, even if I myself am, am uh, I don't know, even if you think I'm, like, a capitalist. Sure, whatever. Who cares? Yeah, I'm a capitalist. Just like most people in the Western world. Okay, what changed? What changed in my analysis? You know what I mean? Nothing. So address the actual points rather than just like looking for hypocrisy, especially because like, let's say I'm a capitalist and I'm actually engaging in anti-capitalist sentiment. Okay. Let's say I'm a capitalist and engaging in anti-capitalist sentiment. I'm a class trader. Okay. Okay. Well, I still have money. You, on the other hand, are advocating against your best interest and you don't have money. Advocate yes, for your best interest. Rejoicing for the death of innocent civilians in Israel. This is what have the Arabs seen for years in, 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 uh, on the Arab world. For example, if you look up Sidrot Cinema, this is in 2014 when Israel, when Israel was bombing Gaza. Explain how Israel. racist some people and are. The Israelis in the Sidrot, uh, uh, the kibbutz or the, the settlement, they, were sit, they went on a hill and they had popcorn and they had drinks and they were like watching the show and they were cheering with every rocket coming down. This is what we see. Western me people didn't see that. Well, somebody found a tweet actually of mine yeah. from 2014 mm -hmm. in which I said, at what point does what Israel is currently doing to the Palestinian people become terrorism. Mm. And because I've always said, you know, I've spoken about this a lot over the years and I've always tried to be extremely fair minded, albeit nobody really wants you to be fair minded. They want you to take a side. It's but pretty funny that, that like having the most tepid them, criticism against like Israel's yeah, apartheid absolutely. regime absolutely. is seen as like a peace loving dove. Yeah, that's how like that's that's Google, what the standard is. Google, the standard has already been Google. set. Huh. This is like an, a Jewish wedding. In like he's just such a normal, that's such a normal way to ask, ask like a normal ask yeah, question no, I'm, to I'm, ask. To be clear, I've seen lots of videos. No, 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 but like, I'm not talking to you, Pierce. No, no, I know. I'm, I'm no. talking to the Western audience because, no, I, understand, because I, I want to see like, I want to say like, this is what they mm -hmm. see. I mean, for example, there is a very famous video for Samir Ab Abu Zanin, who is like a young kid that he was shot point blank by an Israeli soldier and he would not allow to have any medical attention. Mm -hmm. And as his dead body was being put into the ambulance, the Jewish settlers were cheering. Mm. So for an Arab audience, this is what we see every day. Mm. Yep. So when they see, oh, we heard them back, mm. we heard their people mm. like they heard back, it is not right. But this is what hate does. Mm. It escalates, it feeds each other. Radicalism feeds it. It is terrible and it is, a, it is just like a vicious circle. So I would like to do something that is very interesting mm. tonight. When I invited John Stewart to my show, as much of like a reception that you, if, if you see on the YouTube, people just like, no, sorry, sorry. we had to cut the five minute standing ovation mm. for broadcast. People were on their feet for mm. five oh. minutes. They could not believe it. I remember uh, John Steele telling me, I could never imagine that a Jewish guy from New Jersey would mm. have that kind of reception in Cairo. Mm. That's so, d okay, John Stewart, classic, classic New Jersey mentality. That's anti-Arab sentiment baked into the minds of every single person, no matter how fucking woke they are. Why wouldn't they? Do something very Why wouldn't they celebrate you? I want to give 
I, I'm, 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 I like telling stories. And I'm going to tell you a very nice story. Tell and away. this is the story, surprise, surprise, of the suffering and the plight of the Jewish people. And I want to say that because it is very interesting when you see the trauma and the suffering that the people on the other side went through, you might understand why, why they're coming through. So this is, see this? Mm -hmm. This is a map of all of the history of the expulsion of the Jews. Yo! I okay, have ne he, never okay. seen minority. Okay, dude. He wa okay, I'm going to say it. He watches the show. And of course, this comes back to the... You know, the whole idea about the original sin that you have... Pull uh, the map out! Trade, uh, 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 Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the, oh, the, reframe the, the, it. The Talk about the Jesus fucking anti-Semitism baked into Christianity. At that time, Jewish people were not allowed to own land. They were just peasants. Even some of the professions were not even allowed to participate. In. But they were allowed to do one thing. Did my video on this come out already? Was prohibited uh, I was trying to get my editors to, to pump that out. So what happens when you work in money? You get rich, not out yet. Never right? Mind. And those Jews lived in ghettos. Now, ghettos was not just like isolated neighborhoods and cities. Sometimes ghettos were outside the city. This is like how isolated they were. And in those ghettos, they have to pay gold to the mayor or the governor or the prince or the noble. So they would say, mm, you're getting richer. I need more taxes. So they pay tax. What happens when you have a business and they increase your rent? You increase your service, increase the taxes. Increase the so what happened? What the Christians started to default. And suddenly, the image of the greedy Jew was created. Shylock, merchant of Venice. This was the kind of oppression that the Jewish people went through. Fast forward 19th century, there was like the Eastern Jew in Ukraine and, and Russia, and there was the Western Jew, uh, Jews in Europe. Those people in the, East, the Eastern Jews had to immigrate because they were pogroms and they were like, you know, kicked out. And at a certain point, the people in the West, especially in England, it's like, mm, there are too many Jews. We need a solution. The solution for what? For the Jewish problem. So it's like, we need to get rid of them. And you know what? Palestine was not even on the, in the A-list. Palestine on the, was in the B-list. Because England proposed 6,000 square miles in Uganda for the Jews, 1903. And the reason why Palestine was not on the list, that it was objected by a lot of rabbis that said, like, it's a promised land, but only when the Messiah comes. But uh, there were other options, Argentina, South Africa, Uganda, Madagascar. And eventually, they said, all right, let's do Palestine. So they went to Palestine in 1914. There was 700,000 people living in Palestine, 3% were Jewish. 1917, Belfort Declaration. Arthur Belfort, he called the Jewish people in England that they are alien and hostile race. And the thing is, the only Jewish member of the parliament, of the English parliament, Lord Montenegro, he objects that, like, these are British citizens. They, we should not kick them out. Yeah. So they pushed them, they pushed them, but it was not going fast enough. Came the Nazis. And then it was not about the solution anymore. It was the end losing, the final solution by Hitler, because he needed an answer for the Jewish question, the Jude Frage. And then, the, as you see, the Holocaust happened, the most orchestrated, industrialized, horrible genocide in our modern time. Six million Jews died. So it accelerated, and they went. First of all, they left East Europe, and they went to West Europe, and they went to America, and they were turned down, and they were pushed towards Palestine. So by 1948, right before the declaration of the State of Israel, there were two million people living there. Only 30% of them was Jews. So the whole idea of like a land without a people to a people without a land was a marketing thing. They were already Palestinians. So suddenly, overnight, 1948, there were 1, 1.5 million Palestinians, seven, half of them, three quarters of them were overnight pushed into refugees. Yeah. And this is why it's called the Nakba, the catastrophe. So now we have all of this building up into the minds. And, that, and so, suddenly this was like a conflict, a hate, a problem that we didn't have to do anything with. This was basically pushed on us by the Europeans. Mm -hmm. You see? See, this is why it is important to say that. And I'm not saying that just like, oh, let's wipe out the state of Israel. Let's like push up in the sea. No, but it's important when you talk about the conflict, that you talk about the root cause, right? No, there, were a, there was like a vibrant Palestinian culture happening over there. And right now they are erasing this culture. Suddenly I'm seeing of like Israeli feta cheese. Israeli hummus, oh, that's an insult. Israeli hummus, come on. I mean, take the land, but leave the hummus, man. I mean, come on. I mean, that's, that's not fair. <laughs> you are someone who's always spoken against culture, uh, uh, cancel culture. Yeah. Right now, a whole culture is canceled. <laughs>
Yeah, Israeli Hamas is is uh is one that strikes at the fucking heart of of many people. It's like, are there Arab Jews? Of course there are. But they they don't love Hamas cuz they're uh Jewish. They love Hamas cuz they're Arab. It's crazy. Falafel too. <clears throat> what is this video about the uh the Rabah massacre? Okay. We'll we'll uh, take a look at it. They love Hamas cuz it's the bomb. I mean, it's the best. No, I will never condemn Hamas. I love Hamas. Dude, actually converted Pierce Morgan with that conversation? No, I think Pierce Morgan is like over the course of of uh many uh weeks now. I I think like he's he's I wouldn't say he's like an honest person by any means, okay? I think he's a he's a clout guy. I think he knows that there's a lot of people in the Arab world that watch when he has on people who are pro Palestine. It's a uh, it's an avenue that is not like very well represented. But I think in that process, maybe he's just like changed his opinion a little bit. Like, I don't, I feel weird handing it to him in under any circumstance. Okay. I feel weird handing it to him. It's like, it's like handing it to the top of the hour ad break. You know what I mean? Comes at the top of the hour. If you no longer want to see the three minute ads, all you need to do is subscribe, which you can do for $5 or for free with a Twitch Prime. Here's the three minute ad break now. I'm going to launch off of the ad break that they presented on talk TV and give you mine. This man, a guy has to be more well-versed in European history to explain problems in his part of the world. While all those Western fuckers keep yapping without reading a single book about the middle East. Yes. My friend shot in Freud up as you know, just as well as I do that in order to actually fucking make a clear and coherent argument that cuts through the noise against the dominant media narratives against the dominant cultural forces you have to be, one, very careful. If you overstep or say something that can be misconstrued, they will immediately shove that down your fucking throat and belittle you. Think about how people have uh, been saying that I am pro-Hamas and pro-baby killing and all this fucking nonsense, despite the fact that I have time and time again condemned it and have been very much anti-baby killing my entire media career, public uh, media career. It does not matter. Two, in order to be able to like truly explain the the developing attitudes, you also have to be relatively uh, knowledgeable about the the history of the region and what has happened Top throughout Jewish time. Jewish journalist for the Guardian newspaper. You wrote a very interesting column last week. In which That's why said, I always say it's fucking much easier to just like you it's much easier to to basically say all Palestinians are terrorists is Hamas. Some of these terrorists have to die. Sorry, sucks to suck. Because a lot of people already have Islamophobia. And he was they, already, they already have that narrative. Sides, unless you really understand the history. But do you, would you agree with that? Would you agree that both sides have legitimate just cause? Not with the methodology that's taken place. And you've given an extremely detailed analysis of the build-up to what happened in 48. To me, it's pretty clear. 700, 800,000 Palestinians were displaced from their Overnight. homes. And it should never have happened. And that has been absolutely technically not overnight for so much resentment. But can you at the heart of this debate agree with Jonathan that you could argue there is just cause on both sides? There is a, there is a cause on both sides, but I, I, I'm, I'm walking on a tightrope here because yeah. I'm not a Palestinian. Yeah. Uh, but from the Palestinian <laughs> point of view, th there's a lot of people. I mean, there are 2.2 million people. Did you just say the Nakba was a just cause? Can you say it's a just cause? Back. There is 350,000 people living in East Jerusalem, and there is like si six or seven million people living outside. Mm -hmm. Those people, the Palestinians that were pushed out, they do not have the right to go back. Right now, if you meet Palestinians, you'll see them wearing a necklace with a key. That key is their house that they were kicked out from in, in Yaffa and in Haifa. You know, like my, my, my wife's family comes from Ramla, which is 50 miles from Gaza. And, and, and according to the law, those people have absolutely no right to go back. Even you, if you are a Palestinian with an American passport, they give you hell in order to go in. And yet, a Jewish person born anywhere in the world, born in Poland, born in the Ukraine, no question asked, he can jump on a plane, land in Israel, and get the, 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 the Israeli citizen and take a house that most probably belonged to a Palestinian. So it is not just like, a, it is an ongoing injustice that has been happening. Now, I mean- Where would you criticize if you're being fair-minded? Where would you criticize from 48 onwards the behavior of the Arab side. 
Well, put yourself uh, in the Arab side. In 1948, you constituted 70% mm -hmm. of the population. Suddenly, the UN is giving you 48% of the land, right? Not just that, I mean, the, the Arab regimes, because they did terribly. And see, this is the thing, like, Arab nationalism at the height of that, these people feed on each other. You know, because it's very, very important to have a problem. Mm. Oh, it's Israel. And then, and for what, Israel, oh, it's what did I miss? It's a very good distraction. I Fuck. mean, sometimes I feel that like the Palestinian cause is did very it, useful for both sides to stay did, there as attention. Did he do the classic like, well, the Jews were expelled but, thing? Uh, and this is a very important question because the, in the mind of the... No, Western I'm not going to go back. I'll watch it later. They always thought of the Palestinian resistance or the Palestinian side as like Islamic, as militant. No. As a matter of fact, some of the early suicide bombers were female Christian Palestinians because they, like the IRA, you know, they were fighting for a land. The whole idea of Islamization of the whole cause came very later. As a matter of fact, you will find this very interesting because yes! when I saw this, I did not believe Speak it. Speak on it, motherfucker! This, you know, the Fatah movement, which is the PLO, the okay, Fatah. Okay. This was their uh, slogan. Can you see? You see, there's a crescent, a cross and a menorah. And they say, unitary, democratic, non-sectarian. So basically, in the 1960s, Fatah were basically marijuana smoking tree hugger hippies. And yet that didn't work, right? And the thing is, I always hear that like, Arabs were giving two, four, so many chances for peace. That is not true. Yes! As a matter of fact, Speak on it, motherfucker! All along history, Israel didn't give an inch of land by peace. And only like took, and only took more land. They gave back Sinai because uh, Egypt like initiated the war. 2006, they went out of uh, south of Lebanon because of the resistance they have. Even the disengagement of, of Gaza, they didn't do it out of the goodness of their heart because they had too much casualties. And even, even, even the Oslo Accords, the peace treaty, the one that Isaac Rabin and, uh, got the Nobel Prize for, they did it because of the Intifada. So what is the message that Israel is giving to the Arabs? I will never give you anything with peaceful resolution. You will always have to fight for it. Do you not think that, for example, I mean, Bill Clinton feels this very strongly. That Fuck there Bill was Clinton. A great deal to be Bill Clinton is suck my cock. Just in the end. Bitch ass motherfucker, lion ass, donkey. To this place, there would be a deal, just walked away. That that was the closest that everybody came. And that actually, I mean, could Clinton have done any more than he tried to do then? I am not, again, that's why it's very important mm -hmm. to have people who are much more qualified than me to talk about this, but two things I can say about that. Number one, uh, the, the whole thing about the Oslo Accord, there was a video for Netanyahu who was talking to the settlement the offer in 2001 and he was bragging about sabotaging. Mm. The, he was talking to us like, I sabotage, it's like uh, there was no yeah. peace. Yeah, you've seen that, right? Yeah. And in that video, if you remember, when, when he was saying, like, you have to hit them hard, 2001, no Hamas at the time. Mm. They, we have, they were talking about the Palestinian Authority. We have to hit them, we have to kill them, we have to make them feel the pain. And then one of them says, like, like Bibi, but wouldn't America kind of just like, so what? Mm. The American public is easily manipulated. 80% are with us. It is absurd. And as a new American, mm. where I can have the um, privilege of being retrospectively angry, I said, like, this guy is mocking the government who is, and the people who have been with him all the time. It's like, oh, they can be easily manipulated. They can do uh, arrogance. Even, by the way, even Isaac Rubin, arrogance. Isaac Rubin, the, the, the one who actually did the peace accord, he was known famously said the way to actually beat those children is to break, break the their with fucking the hands. Bones policy. Yes, they will like get those kids and break their bones on the pavement. So this has it, the whole idea about like no Israel peace loving dove. Peace that motherfucker wasn't fight. a peace lover either. Is a very very actually, bad representation. They still as killed it, him. As it's gone on. The will, the genuine will on both sides for peace, has not existed. No, I think it's been a deceit to the world. Uh, no, I'm sorry. And, and to the relative groups of people on both sides. The official and, a, and actually a betrayal of them. the official stand of the Palestinian Authority. And again, I cannot speak. I mean, mm. It is very difficult to do this. The official stand of the Palestinian Authority is that we are just happy with 22 percent of the land. Just give mm. us like that. Yes, there are people that this. But the thing is, you cannot just say, OK, let's talk about peace. And then you take away my land. Let's talk about peace. And th there's there's a kind of like passive aggressiveness happening. Oh, let's talk about it, but I'm going to build settlements. 
I'm going to suffocate your cities and your villages. You see, I think I'm that has been incredibly inflammatory. Yes. Worsening the situation. I think putting back the chance of peace. I mean, Netanyahu, I, I interviewed Netanyahu earlier this year in the middle of the big social protests in his own country. And I couldn't understand what he thought he was doing, except that it seemed to me political expediency that he had to, to get power, uh, you know, again, he had put a bunch of right-wing headbangers into his cabinet who have incredibly bad records, speak in an incredibly incendiary way about uh, Palestinians, for example, and that he did this for power. And then he launched a, because they were pushing him to do it, a ridiculous assault on the integrity of the Supreme Court, the independence of the Supreme Court. And, and many Israelis rose up. So mm -hmm. Netanyahu is, has become to me a big problem. Right? And, and the people, that all the polling shows that. Israeli people are very unhappy with Netanyahu. I don't think he's ever going to actually want to forge peace. And in fact, I think he was It's not just Netanyahu. It's not. This is Israel's official government position. That that would just like when it comes to yeah, continuation of endless war in the Middle East, it was Israel. America's it official was government the, position until uh, it was not. It did not matter if it was Barack Obama or George W. Bush. Netanyahu is no different than other so leaders we, we, in Israel we'll never have in that to. regard. This, in, this, look, this includes Yitzhak Rabin as well. There, there's a book, and, and, there, and I would say most of his cabinet. There, there's now. a book called The Fear of Peace. It's called by Moshe Zimmerman. Mm. And he's an Israeli historian. And he said, like, the average Israeli citizen does not have a vision of peace. Mm. Because for 70 years, this is a country that has been the military. The war has been going on for a while. Mm. They have been expanding because of war. The military is taking over. So the whole idea of peace is not even there. Mm. It's not just Netanyahu. Like, What's your opinion on the Patrick Dye have, situation at I Cornell University? Put him in jail, bro. Put his bitch ass in jail. Yes. And I think you tweeted that like that was like uh, a very death threats. Um, kind of reason. Anti-Semitic hate crime, death threats. Yeah, Put his reason. bitch ass oh, yeah. in jail. Yeah, but like, fuck I, you I, mean? This, What's Nath my Nathalie, opinion? In the, he went after Queen Rania. Mm. Smoking on and it. And you call up shame on Queen Rania. No, I didn't say reasonable. I just said this. I, I did a, a fire emoji. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just said what he was saying. Yeah. I mean, is it, I was going to ask you about Queen Rania. Let's ask about since yeah. you've raised it. Yeah. Because Queen Rania accused the West. No, of this is an issue regarding singular Israeli leaders. It might have been all of them, but it has nothing to do with. State. And the world is not okay. even calling for a ceasefire. So the silence is deafening. And to many in our region, it makes the Western world complicit. Uh, now, other people said, well, OK, if you feel that strongly, why aren't you taking in any Palestinians? Why is Egypt not taking ah, Palestinians? Why does the Arab the world want to taste. constantly attack Israel without actually offering any place to go for the yeah. Palestinians. Imagine those fucking dogs in leadership are actually fucking exactly representative of the people's opinion. Starts third war three. This is the war solution. These are Palestinians. These are their land. Mm. And then suddenly take them. Why? So they've been basically kicked around from their homes. And now another country should take them. You see what would happen? Imagine this. Mm. Now. And because Israel, the official, has been talking openly about this. Mm. It's like, why don't they just go in Sinai? Why do they go? Mm. You know what would happen? Those people are going to be pushed in Sinai. And with any population, two million people, they are living in refugee camp. What do you think will happen? Unrest, mm. uh, uh, chaos. Mm. And then after a few years, the Western media will come with their cameras like, oh, look at those Arabs. Oh, they're killing each other. Oh, Israel is good that they got rid of them. And then they will go to the West Bank. And so they know 3.5 million people push into Jordan. This, the whole idea, why does Jordan take them? Why does Egypt take them? The same question. You, Europe has 44 countries. Why don't they take Israel? America has 50 states. Why don't they give them Florida? I mean, they, we seem to complain about Florida the whole time. Why don't they just like give uh, Israel? <laughs> the whole idea was like, oh, you're Arabs, you're all the same. No, no, no. Because what would happen then? So Israel will move into Jordan? That's like, oh, Saudi, why don't you take the Jordan? What do you mean this guy smokes? So this is not I a solution. He's been saying the same shit I've been saying. I'm not taking a position yeah. the way. Let me ask you directly. But I want to say something about what Queen Radia said. Okay. The whole idea about like the West. Yeah. I think that in three weeks, Israel morally corrupted the West like no other. I think the West will have a lot of time to recover because for years, the West has been telling us, oh, look, we're liberal. We're all about human rights. All are equal. Adopt our values. And then suddenly, well, you, you don't want to even to cease. We don't want to even tell Israel to stop. 
and suddenly we wake up and we found McDonald's are giving free meals to the Israeli because like nothing will make you feel better after killing a bunch of okay. Palestinian okay. kids okay. than a happy meal. You know? Then happy meals. <laughs> yeah, Bassem Youssef is a great communicator. Obviously, he's a fucking uh, long... I mean, bro, he's he's been in media for almost as long as I've been alive. You know that, right? Um, so, of course, even though we say the same exact things overall, he going to be much better at saying it, I think. All right, here, you guys have been wanting me to watch this clip real bad. Let's uh, take but a I look. But I can tell you that we are not targeting anyone else in Gaza but civilians. Hamas is cynically, uh, but rather, but rather uh, uh, terrorists, of course. Uh, but I can tell you that we are not targeting oh! anyone else in Gaza but civilians. I mean, it's fucking, Hamas uh, she, she said it. It's so funny because like, this is a minor slip, right? No, it's not mask hop. It's not. She's she fucked up. It's like when I accidentally say Hamasabi because I've heard it so many goddamn times. Except the reality for her is that is basically what they're fucking doing. It is. It is what they're doing. So of course, it's a it's just like a moment of honesty. Uh, but I here. can tell you that we are not targeting anyone else in Gaza but civilians. Hamas is cynically, uh, but rather, but rather. Uh, uh <laughs> He's like, I could tell you with a certainty, we're not targeting anyone in Gaza except for the civilians. We're only killing civilians, dog. Uh, but I can tell you Straight that we're not targeting anyone else in Gaza but civilians. Hamas is... Yeah, there it is. This happened with a former foreign minister too I saw today. Yes, bro. When you... Listen. Listen. There's two different... There's two different voices, okay? Now, when you are on the foreign minister's office, your job is to communicate... The Israeli position in like liberal terms, right? To a broader audience in the West. When you are uh, speaking in Hebrew, that message is usually to an Israeli audience, okay? When you're speaking in English, that message is to the Western world. What ended up happening is you crossed your wires a little bit, okay? I mean, I'll give you an example. I'll give you a fucking example. I'll give you a great one. Like uh, the, the former... Uh, like deputy or whatever of the interior ministry, uh, she came out and very openly said it. She straight up came out and was like, yesterday was, was like, uh, br 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 where is it? Let me see if I can find it. Wait, hold on one second. Jordan Uni follows you. What do you mean Jordan Uni? This is Jordan Yule. I'm trying to figure out if I can find the fucking, um, uh, oh, here it is here, here, here. Israel's former public diplomacy minister is erase all of Gaza from the face of the earth that the Gazan monsters will fly to the southern fence and try to enter Egyptian territory or they will die and their death will be evil. Gaza should be erased. Minister Galit Distel Atbarian continues and fire and smoke on the heads of the Nazis in the West Bank. A vengeful and cruel IDF is needed here. Anything less is immoral, just unethical. Atbarian is from Netanyahu's Likud party. Okay, remember, like she's saying it in Hebrew, so you know it's living in Gaza amongst the civilian population. If Israel has decided to eliminate a terror group, Hamas, as the world did with ISIS, for example, and I think there are a lot of parallels given the way they behaved on October the seventh to ISIS. How do you do it? How do you do it if you don't do it the way Israel is currently? trying to do it. Exactly not the way that Israel <clears throat> does it, because if you have the, one of the most advanced military powers in the world, and it takes you three weeks, 9,000 Palestinian civilian death, 21,000 injured. As we are talking right now, hmm. Israel just bombed Kichibalia, which is a known refugee camp. This, it is a very, it was wild yeah, seeing a, Americans. You know, it was wild like seeing Americans be like, "What? It doesn't look like a refugee camp. Right it's got buildings." Camp. This is a no-value question. There's no tents. This is a no-value question. Well, I would ask a different point. I would say, not only do they have a right to defend themselves, which every country would yeah. after a terror attack, right? But they actually have a duty and responsibility to their population to try and stop that happening again to them. They've been doing, and I do, I do understand, and I agree with that. Yeah, but but here's the thing. If it takes you all of that time, all of these civilians, to take out a few hundred guerrilla fighters... We don't know how many of the people who died. Thousand. We don't know. It do doesn't we? matter. Yeah, but Basim, you don't know and I don't know. We don't know. but right? like We don't even know if the casualty numbers are correct because they're all coming from Hamas. And we, the should, health authority, and, and we should believe Israel? No, no, not necessarily, no. 
No, I, I don't believe either side. But, but, but here's my problem but, with But here's my point. I don't think we should assume that we know these statistics okay. are correct. That's mm -hmm. crazy. I don't think we should assume we know exactly how many Come on, come on, come on. Kick his ass. Fucking, we do dude, 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 kick so his ass. Get the fuck out of here. Bro is denying what you can see with your fucking eyes. ...have been killed in the last three weeks. We just don't know, do we? So basically we're, te we're dealing with a very incompetent military force that has been sucking America dry for years and then they cannot do the job. But how else do they get rid of Hamas? Not like that. How do they do it? I don't know, but not like that. Because they've been I know. To have peace. They have, uh, peace. All, I'm not a peace. Peace. Look at the history. Look at the history of the conflict. Peace. The That's the only way to starve out mm -hmm. any kind of reactionary force. Through peace. This is not an eye for an eye anymore. This is an eye, a limp, a life, a house, but a they neighborhood, they a whole population sit, for an eye. That they don't sit. I mean, your, your friend Ben Shapiro that you particularly despise. Oh, he, I love Ben Shapiro. He's yeah. very smart. Oh, yeah, <coughs> but you, you've been very critical of him, and that's fair enough. I'm sure he would be of you. But when I asked him about proportion, he said, there is, I don't care about a, a proportionate response. So let's right? kill civilians as... Hamas did the this, so we are going to get rid yeah, of Hamas. But, but, but he, it's not, it's not, in his eyes, it wasn't eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It was this group of terrorists did this, and we are now going to rid the world of these terrorists. And this is very important to look at things in context. When you see how Israelis talk inside their community. Mm -hmm. There was a very famous post by Uri Eritzel. Uh, he is the... Uh, speechwriter of uh, Netanyahu, he said, what is so horrific about understanding that the whole Palestinian people are our enemies? All of them are enemy combatants. We should call them, kill their mother, destroy their homes, the homes that they raised, those snakes, so no snakes will be raised in this house anymore. And this was reposted by Ali Chaket, which is the minister of, wait for it, justice. Yeah. Those, this, it's not about Hamas anymore. It is not about Hamas. They, they can tell you it's about Hamas, but it's not about Hamas. It is basically, it has, they have said it many times, Pierce. This is a way to kind of push them into Sinai. This is not about eradicating Hamas. This ship has sailed. I am sorry, but like uh, anybody who still never about, this is about Hamas, Hamas is stupid. Why did they do it they, before I, I Hamas? I don't agree with that. Really? No, because I think. But why, so why are why there? I tell you, I don't agree. There are like hundred people. I think any Gaza country, and, uh, any country like? that suffered the kind of terror attack that Israel suffered, with the kind of death toll that occurred that day, 1,500 plus people. Okay, then if fucking Gaza has a kids, nuke, then they can just deploy raped, it on Israel then? Beheaded, Would you have the same rebellion. perspective? Would you say the same thing, Pierre? I mean, they found, a, they found a young woman's skull, right? Somehow but I, but been, what about the, somehow it had been but severed But what about from, the babies that were beheaded? Well, there was a report, and you and I had this discussion on there. You falsely quoted me, and I wanted to clarify that with yeah. you in person. You thought I'd said that 40 babies had been so beheaded. what did you say? I never said that. What did you say? I said it's been reported that 40 babies were killed, some of whom had been beheaded. That's what I said. Yeah. Totally, so there's a, totally different. Yeah. There's a very different... Well, it is different. Yes. Do you, do you accept it? Um, English is a second language, so... Things but they're different might, things. Of course, yes. Between sure. saying 40 babies have been beheaded and 40 babies... Have been right, reported to be even killed, hit the ESL. So where are those beheaded, were beheaded. Well, apparently journalists are being shown utterly okay, horrific okay. footage. This is this comes to a very important question about credibility. Again, I'm not condoning what mm. happened in October, September, but in I'm not a journalist. Mm. But as a journalist, wouldn't you take anything that an authority would say with a grain of thought? Yes. Especially if this authority have a long history of lying. And I'm just going to give a few examples. 1996, they bombed Khanna. It's a refugee camp. They killed 106 people. Uh, despite that they knew it's a refugee camp. They said, oh, maybe it's a one time off. 2006, they bombed Khanna again. 2014, they killed two teenagers at a checkpoint. They denied, as usual, but CNN was there. So they said, mm, we have to say it. 2018, they killed a medic. A Palestinian medic and they doctor, they fabricated a video showing yep. that it's someone else, that he was a human shield. And then I they, would say, no, no, can, can I just like finish? Yeah, that? but I do want to respond. And, the, and then 2010, they killed Ahmed or Aikat, mm. denied it, then said, oh, it's okay, it's mm. us. 2021, they bombed the media office in Hawass, mm. it's not us, but no, I'm sorry. And then 11th May 2022, mm. Shirin Abu mm. a reporter. Your colleague, she's Palestinian, American citizen. She was shot in the head. And they provided forensic evidence and even a doctor's video mm. that it was not them, it was Islamic Jihad. How can I expect to believe this regime, especially if the president of Israel comes down with this ridiculous, ridiculous thing? Have you seen in there? there? No. He said, okay. This was reported by Sky News, mm. and it was the funniest thing I've seen so much. This was a Colin Powell moment, mm. but like the cheap edition. 
Mr. Uh, Herzog said, like Isaac Herzog, it's like we have found evidence on one of Cooking. the uh, um, terrorists, a manual to create chemical bombs, mm. <clears throat> and then he showed this. <laughs> And you should, That's this the is, thing. Like, I, I just their 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 counter isn't even good. They're just like fucking like freestyling at this point because it doesn't matter because the American media, Western, Western media, will eat it, eat it up no matter how fucking crazy. silly it is. And and uh, what, what what you like have like local ingredients to make. And then this is like this is a manual of al Qaeda, of course, convenient certain Qaeda. And let me read it to you in Arabic because this is funny. So al Nashr Dawla al Maniya bi Tatwir al Zati wa al Ma'rif al Mujahideen, which basically say. <laughs> This is basically like a catalog for self-improvement for Mujahid. <laughs> I didn't know that they have life coaches. So this, and you know what, it's kind of you said, it's like, we cannot confirm or uh, any of this, but we will show it anyway. So let me respond. Let me so respond. this is like, a, a, let me respond. A, this is a lying government. So let me respond. Yes. I do think the Israeli government has lied. All the time. Right? I do think they've lied. I'm not going to dispute that. I do think they've been caught lying. I do think they've said things that turned out not to be true. I also think that two weeks ago, a hospital was bombed, yes. and it was immediately. Who do you think did it? Well, I'm going to tell you what I think. Mm -hmm. Hamas immediately tell the world it was an Israeli airstrike, and that 500 Shocking. people were killed, and that the hospital had been destroyed. And then, as the next couple of days go by, the hospital is relatively undamaged. The car park was obliterated. Many fewer people than 500 were killed. How many people died? Well, we don't know because actually we're reliant on the Palestinian health authority, which is mm. Hamas in Gaza, for the figures. So we don't know the number. But a lot fewer people died, it would appear, than the like 500. We don't know. 50? Either way, it's appalling, but it may not have been anywhere near as appalling as was first said by Hamas. But here's the point. Most independent studies of what happened have concluded that it was almost certainly a militant stroke terror group inside Gaza and they fired a rocket which landed in the hospital car park. We still in other words, do not have any aspect. evidence for this, by the way. So I have an issue with that. Mm -hmm. We don't have any physical attack, evidence. The priest and the patriarch of the hospital, because it's called the, pa the Baptist mm -hmm. Hospital, said that they have received warning, multiple warning from Israel that they're going to mm -hmm. hit the hospital. Mm -hmm. It then, blows my fucking the mind. One of the... Like, I, I'm telling you, it blows my mind, especially because the reality is it could still very well be an Islamic Jihad rocket. Okay, it could. The problem is... No, they didn't. Anyway, let's just listen to them. Numbers. That's not true. Okay. The New York Times has not reported that it was Israel. No, they said... They haven't. Okay. That's not true. Over 10 years, Hamas launched... 35,000 rockets mm. into Israel. They and many failed. They killed 69 people. Mm. And 25% uh, military, only part of them were civilians. So over 10 years of 35,000 rockets, they killed 69 people. Mm. But in one strike, you want to tell me that these glorified firecrackers caused that kind of damage? Uh, yes, it looks like they did, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was a very good way to uh, dismiss this. So my original, uh, my original and immediate reaction to it was incredibly justified. Anyone who tells you otherwise is wrong. I will go to bat. I will, I will fucking argue against them. And not only that, but also my immediate assumption still stands. I said on the first day, given the fact that Israel had bombed this hospital before, given the fact that Israel immediately lied and said that they weren't doing a fucking military, an Israeli Air Force campaign in the area while they actually were doing it. We saw it with our own two eyes using the same Al Jazeera live stream coverage that Israel tried to use falsely to create a new narrative. Okay. And knowing what I know about Israel routinely lying about bombing attacks uh, and then trying to blame it on uh, Islamic Jihad or, or Hamas, that of course, all of the circumstantial evidence on top of the only verified footage that we had at the time being consistent with an airstrike, okay, with the audio cues at the very least, being consistent with an airstrike, made me understandably say, there's is very likely to be Israel, it's definitely Israel, and also, the only way that I will say it's not Israel, considering that they had dropped 7,000 bombs thus far and had hit that very same hospital with an artillery shell in the past, two days prior, okay, is that as long as... 
if there is a third party independent investigation that does soil testing that shows that finds fragments one way or another, there's always fragments. Okay. <clears throat> what the fuck is this? Oh my God. Why does no one ever talk about all the goddamn airstrikes around the hospital? I did. I talked about it. Anyway, my point is this. I was wrong on my assertion that uh, I uh, that it was a, a, a Mark 84 rocket. The damage was not consistent with that. The crater was not consistent with that. The damage from the human casualty was, but the on-the-ground damage showed that that wasn't the case. That much is true, okay? Since then, Israel has also bombed around a hospital heavily multiple times, multiple other hospitals. They've blew, they blew up, the, uh, they blew up the, the church structure in a Christian church. Anyway... That's besides the point. What I'm trying to explain here is all of the circumstantial evidence absolutely fucking lutely points to this being Israel. Unless there is actual conclusive evidence that it is not Israel, why the fuck would you ever assume, especially going just off of what Israel has said, which has been completely countered, completely and utterly discredited by the New York Times, by the BBC, and every other fucking outlet now at this point with forensic journalists that looked into Israel's claims and immediately said, no, this is not true. We are, this is completely unverified, unsubstantiated. Why the fuck would you ever go, yeah, no, uh, although Israel has killed 8,000 Palestinians so far, 3,000 children so far, this one, it's not them. And also, not only that, but the idea... And it makes me go fucking crazy, especially when I think about this, okay? The idea that, like, it's only bad when Islamic Jihad accidentally blows up their own people. Like, that's the only condemnable action. Every other fucking explosion that has killed a Palestinian child is good. But the one time, like, even if we are to assume that what Israel is saying is correct, even if we are to assume what Israel is saying is correct, then what is the argument here? That it's only bad? If Islamic Jihad accidentally fucking blows up their own people, but when Israel is deliberately destroying the entirety of the fucking Gaza Strip and, and killing 3,000 plus children, then that's good? Those are all good kills? Those are all good confirmed kills? If you ask the Israeli television channel that shows the death toll, by the way, they believe the Gazan Health Ministry. They use the Gazan Health Ministry's casualty numbers to say, 8,000 plus civilians have died, including the fucking children. That's what they say. So they believe the Gazan Health Ministry, and they say all of those Palestinians are terrorists. They call them terrorists in Israel. That's what they say on the fucking television. You cannot listen to what Israel says and then refuse to hear what they say when they're being fucking bloodthirsty. Lil head bro just can't accept he was wrong and jumped the gun. You can fucking cry and complain all day, every day. The truth is not on your side. I've said since day fucking one. By the way, thank you for the $3 donation, dumbass. Said it from the first day. I said this to Ethan as well, and I said it in general. You think about killing Jews the first thing in the morning. He mm -hmm. thinks about being there at 5 o'clock at the first 50 people in the line for bread because yeah. if he doesn't, he will miss the food for his family. And he goes back. And he finds a message saying that we are going to bomb your house. He comes back, he loses his old family. Now tell me, what is a proportionate response for that? I don't know. I don't know. You cannot create terrorism and then you... Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, you have, they, they have created but would this. You, I, don't, I don't know is the answer. But Bassam, let me ask you this. Hamas will have known when they perpetrated what they did on October the 7th, what the scale of response was likely to be. How does that help the Palestinian people? I don't know. That they are supposed to serve. I don't know. The, 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 the wheels are it, already it, set it, in but motion. It, but it doesn't, does it? I do not. You know, <laughs> I feel sometimes that Hamas is with us in the room. That we are, we are bringing Hamas. Who has the power in this equation? Who has the fourth largest and strongest military power? Mm. The whole idea about Israel is like, oh my God, we are the, the Arabs are going to destroy us. Look at the map. Hamas, because, well, hang on, let me, no, hang on. Hamas's stated goal is the eradication yeah. of Israel and the Jewish people. Yes. They make no pretense about it. They've made no attempt, unlike the Nazis. Well, that's to not even true anymore, but they've it doesn't matter. They've made no attempt to yes. try and deny what they They brazenly boasted about it. Yes. They are proud of what they did, mm -hmm. right? And they will have known again, 
that the scale of what they did on October the 7th would have prompted this kind of response, which would have led to thousands of innocent Palestinians getting killed. And my question for you... I wish the 7th of October never happened. Right, but my... Every time, but every my question time is, something You say happened. Hamas is everywhere. Well, yeah, it, actually, all roads, yes, but, but, all but, roads on this but, particular okay. part of the crisis, and I accept it's been going on for 75 years, this conflict, but all roads in this crisis lead to Hamas and what they did. And, all, and not necessarily, because, it, well, because yes. all roads go to the condition that created Hamas. If the, if the Jewish people were expelled from Europe and went to Argentina or South Africa and Uganda and went in and took the land, you would have Hamas in all but of you these You and places. I can agree that the conditions Palestinian people have had to endure in Gaza for a very long time are completely unacceptable. I think it's completely unacceptable yes. that Israel has wielded such control over the people of Gaza, working out who can come in and who can go out, turning on and off water and power on a whim, turning off the internet on and off at a whim, I all love that kind of like, stuff. I can completely agree. Oh, that's really fucked up. But and Palestinians, I think we agree, Hamas understandably are a can't okay. be get, Let's say get mad at that. my question. Mm -hmm. Given that we agree that Hamas is a terror mm -hmm. organization, mm -hmm. who have a publicly stated position of annihilating not just Israel, but Jewish people, mm -hmm. and as we saw on October the 7th, they mean it, if you are Israel, what do you do to get rid of those people who have shown the world that's exactly what they will actually do if they get the chance? You know what I would do? I would give the Palestinians what they deserve. Terrorism is a virus. Mm. Yes. It's a virus. I agree. If a patient with a flu came to you and you're a doctor, mm. how can you treat that patient? How do you treat them? As a doctor, how do you do? Well, you're the doctor. You give them nutrition. Yeah. fluids yeah. and rest so the immunity of the body gets rid of the virus on its own mm -hmm. if I received that patient with a flu and I took a sledgehammer it's like why are you not getting better do you think that patient will get better no you are weakening him you are making him worse I think if you have two groups of people who are ideologically wedded to your destruction as a state and as a populace yeah. and you're constantly firing rockets as Hamas have done for over a decade now. Mm -hmm. This radicalizing yet, only goes in one direction, Piers, you for you. Stop. That's the problem. These are terrorists who've now shown on October. Like he do, he says Israelis are fucking radicalized by Hamas rockets, which literally are nothing in comparison to what Israel does. Like straight up, statistically, objectively. And then he goes, Israel is radicalized. They have to do something. They have to do terrorism. Much worse terrorism in comparison to fucking Hamas. I think on both sides is inevitable and should happen as a consequence of what they did. The big question is, how do you do that? And I don't know The answer is simple. Way, yes, I, it's so simple. It's Israel not that hard. It is doing. not. Hence my personal The application and the this. practice of said answer might be difficult. But the answer from a moral quandary well, perspective question, is simple. That is not even a question. Well, <laughs> that was not even a question no, because that would be ridiculous. You talk, about, you talk about the normalization of the region. I mean, the theory that I most buy into supported by recent, I think, Wall Street Journal reporting that hundreds of Hamas terrorists had gone to Iran for training before this attack. Okay. It had obviously been very carefully organized, and so that is, I think, highly likely. But if you're Iran, and you're looking at all this normalization, and you're looking at Saudi Arabia being next, this is your worst nightmare. So a perfect time to commit an atrocity like this through your proxy of Hamas. Again, I'm not a, a political expert to know mm. what is the background, but let me tell it's you. It's a likely theory. Is, is Hamas justified? Is all of the horrible conditions that Palestinians mm. are living in, is that a justification for Hamas doing what they did in October no. 7th? Good. Do you think so? Of course not. Right. So we're agreed. No, of course. And it may well be here, by the way. Wait, keep as going. I said, that if Israel. So then ask, is Israel's fucking response a justification? Horribly. It leads to a much wider conflict involving many other people, possibly including Iran directly. And it could be a horrendous escalation and a massive war raging through the whole region. Did they and cut that, that, is that part? that's my fear about it. But I come back to the central point of justification. And I'm really struggling to see what else Israel is supposed to do to get rid of Hamas. And if you've got an alternative, let's hear it. I do. Peers, this is never about Hamas. It's a llama. Believe me, it is never about Hamas. If somebody tells you who they are, listen. Israel has been telling the world all the time they need to clear the Gaza Strip into Egypt. You think that's always been the plan? Always there. 
I mean, yes. they have said it. Why did they, they settle it? it? Many times. Why did Why they does, settle Gaza in the same way that they settled the West Bank? Of course. And do you think when Egypt takes them, do you think they'll go back? No, never. And then when they're done with Gaza, they will go back to the West Bank. They will kind of like build the settlements around them and then until they push them into Jordan, because that is the plan. They have talked, not just Benjamin Netanyahu, everybody said like, there's no state, two states. It is one state and it's for the Jews. I don't people. think he believes in a two state solution. Nobody believes in a two state solution. <laughs> Okay. Couple things, couple things, couple things. What? Do you agree Hamas needs to go, though? Of course. But the reality is, the only way to do that is doing the exact opposite of what you've done so far. The conditions you've created made Hamas. The conditions you created created Hamas. That's it. It's it. There is no violent force. There is no surgical strike that removes Hamas from power. If you wanted to fucking uh, do a surgical strike, I mean, you know where the leaders are. There's two conflicting thoughts inside of the Hamas organization that, uh, that you can hear from. You have one guy in Lebanon and you have another guy in Doha, okay? They both have like, to varying degrees, have said the same thing. You also have other uh, for, uh, like foreign ministers and, and things of that nature, like other members of Hamas all around the fucking world, okay? If you wanted to, you could arrest them and then uh, and, and have an international tribunal, an international criminal court would put, be put together. And it wouldn't be just them, by the way. It would be Israeli officials as well. This is what, it, what I mean when I say uh, international law. If we're going to live in a fucking international rule-based order, we have to do that. We have to do exactly that. We have to do, uh, and, and this will require military action. Military action from the international community. If you want to do globalism, and if you want to talk about international law, you have to follow international law. It can't just be America that just violates it whenever the fuck they see fit. And America's allies or America's expression of imperialism in the, in the uh, Middle East, Israel, gets to do whatever the fuck they want. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Palestinians pled for the rule of international law and never once have a chance neither to be judged by it or use it for their own defense. So skewed and it sucks. Yes. Nobody gives a shit. Why? Because they don't have any material wealth. They have nothing. They're fucking broke boys. They're poor. They don't have like a robust industry. They have nothing. So why the fuck would anybody care about them? That's the real, that's the real shit. The only reason why America even had like something that is remotely, uh, remotely similar or remotely sympathetic to like Palestinians was because of the Gulf leadership and, and the Gulf leadership at the time saying they fucking care about uh, Palestinians or at the very least claiming that they uh, care about Palestinians in an effort to undermine Israeli influence in the region. So that's the only reason why, historically, American leadership had ever given a single fuck about Palestinians. Assume, somehow, we get to a place, possibly at the instigation of countries like Saudi Arabia and others getting directly involved, where you get to a place where Hamas are removed, and I don't quite see how that happens without enormous further bloodshed, but let's assume they get removed. Let's assume that Netanyahu is removed from office, which I think is highly likely just from the fury of his own people about what they see as the defensive and security failings, plus his attack on the Supreme Court already causing huge polarization. Let's assume we get new leadership in both places. Could there still be peace? Could there still no. be a two-state no. solution? No. It can never happen. No, because Israel have already shown it's, it's not about Netanyahu. Mm. It is the policy right. of Israel not to give the Palestinians their city. It has always been there. But what if yes. you find leadership that understands? You will not. But why, you, why, why are you, you so... You will not. Do you not see there's any chance of doing that here? No, not with Israel. Obama, af after he left office, he wrote in his book, the problem with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is that, that one side is extremely powerful mm. and one side is extremely weak. There is absolutely nothing to oblige that strong side to give anything. All over the years, well, Israel showed we. you many times that they are not interested in peace. Leave Gaza. Forget Hamas for a second. The West Bank. What have they been doing in the West Bank? Mm. The illegal settlements did not stop a single day. No, they no. Are and, so, and, it's, and it's completely wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, 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 the thing but it's is, wrong. What I agree the, with you. But you see what they're doing in the West Bank right mm. now? They are creating little Gazas. Mm. They are creating little Gazas. Yeah. And I, until they are like squeeze them. There was, there and is, it's completely wrong. There Gaza. is a hilarious document you call the Wanted 18. Mm. It is like an Israeli-Palestinian co-production. And it tells about the incredible story about the residents of Beit Sahur. It's a Palestinian town next to the Nazareth. And uh, 
They said they don't want to depend on the milk coming from the kaputs. So they bought 18 cows, 18 cows. And they didn't know how to milk the cows or have a cow farm. So, so they were like engineers and, and, and doctors. So they sent people to kind of like to learn how to do the farm. So they bought the cows and they started to produce milk and they started to sell the milk to the villages. The Israeli authorities were not very comfortable. So one day the military government came in as like those cows, and I quote, constitutes an existential threat to the national security of the state of Israel. You need to get rid of them. And the movie goes about like the hilarious attempts of hiding those cows between the butchers and the houses. And in one scene, the, a cow is actually running and the, the Israeli soldiers are like running behind it and they corner it and they corner it and they're about to kill it. You know what did the cow say? You didn't fall for this, cows don't speak. Yeah! <laughs> but you know, it actually said something. You know what did it say? It said, Hamas. But anyways. <laughs> But you see, this is the ideology of the Israeli uh, ruling party. They are not interested. They're not even allowing you to get your own cows. But this comes back to what you were saying at the start, which is about the hate on both sides. No, no, no. I'm not no, talking about the hate. No, it's not hate on both sides. No, no, about shut the fuck up. It's not hate on both sides. Israel One side. That, that mm -hmm. we are like the Western world. We are secular. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this, but they're not just like secular, like, like Christians against their own Arab. I'm talking about like Arabs with Palestinian, with, with Israeli identity. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about them being even racist against their own people. 1950, Yemenis immigrants that came from Yemen and they were in the transition camp waiting to be transferred into Israel. Their kids were taken away from them and given to white Ashkenazi Jews. And because they were not white enough. But Basim, what would He's happen? talking about Jews, Arab Jews. Went to Gaza. He's talking about how fucking racist how Israel is. It's true. Israel. Exactly. Even I wouldn't go to Gaza. Exactly. That's yeah. my point. Yeah, so it, it's a dystopia. Who would, but like, I, but I'm just. So it's not just. It's, you know, you're but, you're but, raising but, points about Israel but, making but, out that somehow uh, they're as bad or worse. No, than no, 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 no. But what's but, going on no, there? No, but Hamas I'm, has no, no, ruled no, no, over uh, yes, the Palestinians but, but in the most what? oppressive way imaginable. I, absolutely, too. but you know what? Hamas never claimed that they are the only democracy in the in the in the right. region. They never claimed that they are secular. They never said that they adopt Western trends. And I they definitely, to... definitely, okay. they did not use that lie in order to carpet bomb a whole country. Okay. Now here, I, I, mean, I, 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 I want to say one example, and I'm going to leave you. All right. Israel, you think that Israel will like? Uh, by the way, the whole thing about the Yemeni children, you can find it in the New York Times. It's called like the uh, the, the lost uh, right. uh, children of Israel, uh, the forgotten. Uh, but even when Ethiopian people were immigrated to Israel. Mm. Ethiopian Jews, women then report, 2013, that's not like 50 years ago. Mm. They reported yep. that they were given against their consent and without their knowledge, contraceptive shots so they wouldn't reproduce because they are the wrong color. Israel is Speak is on it, racist, motherfucker, speak on it, holy fuck. Apartheid country that is projecting this shiny example of secularism and democracy for the people so people can accept whatever they do because they look at Palestinians as lesser people. This is the whole point. 100%. This is the whole point. And I would like to quote Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. He had a quote that say, I don't believe that we have made a great wrong to the red Indians of America or the black people of Australia because they were replaced by a okay, higher race, my, a stronger oh, race, on. a more world wisely race. This is, this is why Queen Rania is criticizing the West. This is why we here said like, where are your values? Because this is the crux of the problem. It's not Hamas, it's not Palestine. I want to quote, it is people I'm looking at us you. as lesser human beings. Basim, I, and I don't dispute the characterization that a lot of the Israel administration look upon Palestinians as lesser people. Otherwise they wouldn't- They treat, even look at the, the Ethiopian the Jews and Yemeni Jews yeah, like I, less. I wouldn't dispute that. Um, I want to quote you mm -hmm. to, to end this. No, why would you end this? Don't end this. We'll be talking for two hours. Why not? At some point we're we have having to end an this. amazing time. We can do another interview. <laughs> well, this one goes big. Um, I think this is a neat way to end it. He said, I actually believe there is a middle ground between everybody and they can meet. I direct my criticism for the extreme of each one of them. That was you, Bassam Yusuf. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. Fucking liberals. I don't liberals, share your man. View liberals. Can never be. It, it, liberalism is a mental disorder. Mm -hmm. I, I think they can't be with the current leadership structures in both countries, or both places. But I definitely think <clears throat> you've got to be optimistic about peace. You just need to find people. I, I, can, I, I hope so. Forge it. I hope so. But the reason. Listen. I refuse to come on my on your show 
when your producer first called me for the first interview mm. because I was scared. I was afraid. For me, that was a career suicide. Because, and, and I have, I, I'm talk, this is even important because you are someone who's always talked about like against cancel structure, about like talking, speaking your mind out. Yeah. Speaking your mind yes. out. I left Egypt and I came to America, the land of the free, the home of the brave, but I didn't know that there was a fine print set that you cannot speak about Israel. Mm. I have issue with that. Israel is a foreign country. They're allies, good. But you we can't speak about Israel. How many people lost their jobs? Even Bella Hadid. Bella Hadid. Bella Hadid. She's, she, she, Bella, Bella Hadid. Hadid. Oh, by the way, Bella she hasn't lost her job. No, she, no. But she's talked about death threats. She's talking no. about like being silenced. Sure. And, uh, by the way, Bella Hadid is with. She's Palestinian. And you know who else? Gigi Hadid sisters. Yeah. I love the Hadid. They are with us. Yeah. Anyway, so I know them both. They're very nice. People. Yeah, but but the thing is, if if you are that high and you cannot speak about it, and it's, it's not about. It's well, you like, can. You just have to. Have, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. You, you, you can, can, but you'll get fucking. I mean, I've spoken out about these silence, and you get shot at, not literally, but metaphorically all day long on social media, but that shouldn't stop people from doing it. I'm just like wondering, as an American- You do? As an American, yeah. But like, I, I'm doing now because like the first interview went well. Right. I'm doing that because I want people to see that you can really speak up and not just get canceled, but get rewarded. My career is going fine. Yeah. It's great because I want people to have the courage. But I, why are, we, there should be no limits. I, I'm, I'm, I agree with I, I'm that. kind of like so, so confused as an American citizen, why every American president, candidate, a presidential candidate, have to go and kiss the hand and bend the knees to APAC? Mm. This is a lobby that works for a, a foreign country interest. Why don't we have like a lobby for Saudi Arabia? It is they're giving us more money. But you know the great thing? You can say that here. Yes. You couldn't say it in Egypt. That's why you're living here. Yes, uh, but again, a lot of people feel the burn, the heat, whenever they come back. But if I, yeah, but if I was an American, I'd be going, oh, all right, Bassem. All right, we'll take the criticism because you can do that in this country. And I'm happy. When you criticize the government in your own country, yeah. they drove you out. Yes, and that's why I came to America, to play the white man's game, to actually to, to, to pass this acquired white privilege to my children. It's not, but the problem, it's not just a country of am, white people. But, but, but here's the problem. And the white man's game, the, the game in America is not a white man's game. It's a game that actually has a democracy and believes in freedom of speech. But there are dog whistles everywhere. You're, you're not going to be put in jail for this interview. Or I can lose my career and I can lose jobs. And you know that. You, you could know in, that. In Egypt, you could. No, here you can In Egypt, too. they arrested here, you. Here you can And too. they threatened you. And, and you would have probably ended up in prison here or you, dead. Here, a lot of people lost their jobs because they spoke up. It depends what they say. Of course, but again... If you're Kanye the, West and the, you spew anti-Semitic no, garbage, no, 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 you're going to lose, will never, you're gonna I, lose I, what I will, you have. I will never adopt that kind of point right. of view. But the thing is, there is dog whistles everywhere. Uh. As I told you at the beginning, you cannot just say it's like anti-Semite, anti-Semite. Like, I mean, uh, now, the, how, how come that the Palestinian flag is outlawed, by the way, it's outlawed in, in Israel. If you raise the Palestinian, you go to jail. And now they're saying like the Palestinian flag is a pro Hamas. No, it's not a pro Hamas. Mm. You know, I was, in, I was in doing a comedy show in Arizona and a guy was like wearing like a, a kofaya, like a scarf. And I took it, and, and I'm not like in hyperbole and like mm. wearing symbols, but I just thought to be because like, why are we, uh, are we gonna uh, outlaw colors mm. and flags? That is, that, that, that is absurd. That is not right. I don't, I agree. I don't think you should, <laughs> but you should certainly outlaw Hamas. Regarding. They're already outlaw. I right. mean, I'm not supporting them. Because they're a terror them. group. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. But the people with the power, the people who supposedly have the... And you should, by the way, I will say this, you should be able to criticize the Israeli government without being accused of yes. being anti-Semitic. But I have in this interview repeatedly, and I'm not anti-Semitic. I just have a problem with all of what the Israeli government's been doing. I, and I have a problem with how any criticism... If he keeps doing this, he will be, though. Because Piers has been cooking too long. Yeah, but a lot of the people doing it are actually anti-Semitic. Yes, but also a lot of Zionists mm. are against Israel that they hate the Jews. You know, it, 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 we've, it, we've discussed that. I want to yeah. end on a happy. Uh, but, but, but before that, I want to just like say two words about the media, which is okay. Uh, please, sure, uh, Mr. Zomlot, the Palestinian yeah. ambassador that you have. Uh, this guy lost six members of his family mm. in an Israeli strike. Mm. And when he went on like some British news thing, he sat down and the, and, 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 and the, the, the lady told him- No, like, Piers does deserve credit. Protest. I gave so, him this credit. I'm sure you don't condemn the killing of Israeli civilians. What? Mm. In the same moment. There's another girl like called Yara uh, Aid. She was like on Sky News. Mm. And, this, and the, the girl was like crying. like, I lost 30 members of my family. 17 of them are children. I lost my best friend. And then, what did you think would happen with, with, 
I'm, forget about empathy. I what think a, a lot of people... What about manners? Well, I think you have to start... I've said this repeatedly. You have to start from a place of humanity. You have yes. to look at what happened on October the 7th and feel utterly outraged and disgusted for the loss of human life. Yeah. And you also have to feel that for what's happening in Gaza to innocent people. But, but, but and if you don't, if you can't feel both in, for both sets of people, both sets of innocent people being killed, if you can't feel a sense of, of despair and horror over their deaths, you don't have any humanity. Believe me, Pierce. Believe me, Pierce. It's not really about that. There's a deep sentiment in the Middle East, in Arabs, that the West do not look at us as equals. Well, you know what? So Ambassador. what I did, I went to the machines. Yeah. And I asked Chad GBT simple questions. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Do Israelis deserve to be free? And you know what they tell me? Yes, Israelis deserve the right like any other people. And then I asked the same question. Do Palestinians deserve to be free? And you know what they tell me? It is complex. It is a sensitive issue. Well, it's not complex. It's not sensitive. The Palestinian people should be free. Yeah, but even the machines well, have oh, and they oh, exactly anti Semite the alert. To freedom, we will, we freedom will. Of expression and the way to lead their lives and to water and to power and to yeah. internet that Israelis have and we have here in America and we have back in my home country of the UK. And I want that for the Palestinian people. We've got to end it there. Okay. Mainly because I've worked up a hell of a hunger right. in two hours of interview and you have brought your wife's cooking. Uh, <laughs> so okay. Hala, so the, tell me again how I do this. Okay, so basically... I take a piece of this, you, put you, it in you, the olive oil, yes. which is from the West Bank. Yeah, from the West Bank. And then a little bit of this. Yes. Like that? Yes, yes. This is like amazing oil coming from the olive tree. Uh, this has come from the West Bank. Mm. Bro, he doesn't deserve it. He doesn't deserve such delicious... thousand olive mm. tree, just to... That is absolutely delicious. I know. Please thank your wife for me. Thank you. Wish her all the best and, and her family, mm -hmm. particularly those who are uh, obviously in Gaza. It's been great to see you. Thank you so much. In America. Let's do it again. Let's do it. I understand what you're saying correctly. Basically, that you said the conditions set by Israeli policies enacted on Palestinians have created Hamas. Do you have an opinion on what should be done differently? What do you think will bring a genuine change? Doing the exact opposite of what they've done thus far will literally, legitimately destroy uh, any kind of reactionary force Dead in his tracks. I'll tell you, there are there have been numerous touch points, numerous hinge points within the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, if you want to call it that, even though I call it an apartheid state, I call it ethnic cleansing. At every single, at every single instance, damn near every single instance, okay? Israel had an opportunity to move in a peaceful trajectory and refuse to do so, and actually purposefully utilized the developed pathway to peace that America was quote unquote forcing their uh, hand into considering as an opportunity to take more land. The most, the, the contemporary example of this is the Palestinian Authority. Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of you do not still understand. Maybe you guys do, but a lot of those at home do not understand the difference between the West Bank and Gaza while People living in the Gaza Strip are Palestinian, and so are people living in West Bank. These two areas are controlled by different forces, forces that have actually been at war with one another historically. The Palestinian Authority has been brought under the Israeli security apparatus. The Palestinian Authority, run by Fatah, secular forces, was basically neutered, okay? Completely neutered.